Well, last week we were in Acts chapter 11, mostly also chapter 10. And there we were looking at the situation where there was this gentleman, Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. And he was a a God-fearing person who was seeking the Lord. And the Lord had given him a vision about sending for Simon Peter and bringing him to his home. And at the same time, the Lord had also given a vision to Peter to reveal to him that he should accept the Gentiles, that the gospel message was for them as well as for the Jews. Now, up until this point, Peter and the others who were uh, of the Jewish background hadn't yet understood that the gospel was to go to all people in all nations. They thought because they were the chosen people and Jesus was the Messiah that he was for them. But the Lord took Peter to Cornelius' house and there the scripture tells us that uh, the spirit of the Lord was poured out upon Cornelius and his household and the others who were there. And in the scripture that's um, here in chapter 11, Peter was explaining to the people back in Jerusalem what had happened. He said, I began to speak, and the Holy Spirit came upon them just as he had on us in the beginning, meaning in a likewise fashion to what happened at Pentecost. And he says, then I remembered that the Lord had said that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he recognized that God was giving the same gift to the Gentiles as he was to the Jews. And, of course, the word Gentile refers to all of the people groups other than the Jews. So that the Spirit was being poured out upon all people in every situation. And it goes on to say that he told this to the folks. And and he said, who was I to oppose God, even though I didn't think I should even be in the household of a Gentile? Here was God pouring out his Spirit upon them. And they said, well, we have no further objections. And they accepted that God was granting repentance, as they said, even to the Gentiles, which seemed to be a bit of a derogatory statement even there in concluding that this was occurring. And what we talked about last week was this reality that the Jews, even though they had come to know Christ, Peter and others, they probably had a measure of pride about their heritage, that the people of Israel were the chosen people. And out of that pride had grown prejudice that not the Old Testament law, but the law that the rabbis had added to it had said that they couldn't even fellowship with a Gentile, couldn't have any contact with them, that it would make them unclean. And yet now they're understanding that the Spirit is pouring out upon all people. And it had to be a challenge for them to accept this because of what was in their heart. So we spent a long time talking about the major barrier to the work of God in us and to the outpouring of His Spirit through us is our own personal pride. And pride manifesting itself in prejudice is likewise a huge barrier to the work of God. We talked, though, that there are lots of different types of prejudice that we have. It's not just one race against another, but it might be one nation against another. It might be prejudice that we have toward a social class of people, whether it's people who are higher than us or lower than us in a social class or likewise in an economic class. We might be intimidated by those who have more or might feel that we're better than those who have less. And all of those are forms of prejudice. It might be about how people look or how they dress or the things that they own or something of that nature. might be we have some prejudice against them because of the positions they have or the fact that they don't have positions in the workforce or something of that nature. And then we can even have prejudice against people because of their Christian faith. I mean, within Christendom, certainly there's prejudice between the denominations in some form or another. And God does not desire that because his love is unconditional and perfect for all people. One of the things that he wants to do for all of us is teach us how to love others in the way that he does. And in order for that to occur, you and I must confront the prejudice that is in our heart and recognize that it is an enemy of our soul and an enemy of what God wants to do in us. And as we were talking about this last week, or if you weren't here and you're hearing this for the first time, I encourage people to really allow the Spirit of God to point out to you places where you have harbored some measure of prejudice. And recognize that when He brings that to our attention, what He wants us to do is repent of it 
and then allow him to change our heart attitude so that we love people regardless of their circumstances, their situation, whatever it might be, that we would love them as he loves them. Now this week I want to continue in Acts, just going to the next chapter, chapter 12. And the title of Sovereign and Intervention is because in this chapter it is clear that God does some things that are His choice and His alone. That whatever humans may desire, they may not fit with His perfect plan. And there are times in the lives of all of us where His sovereign will is revealed. And it is His choice and His alone. So to explore that, we want to go here to Acts 12.1. And it talks about that King Herod has begun to arrest some of the disciples and persecute the early church. And it says, among those, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now, it really is a bit odd that King Herod would set about persecuting the church. Now, the idea that the high priest and others were angered and saw before he was converted, that they were persecuting the church, that was somewhat understandable because of their religious background, thinking that they were putting down something that was an untruth. But really, the church was no real threat to Herod. There's something else going on here. And in fact, I would say that there is a darkness in the heart of this man that has allowed spirits of evil to work through him and that the persecution of the church that is occurring here is literally the hand of Satan working directly or at least through his minions through somebody in a position of power to strongly persecute the church. Now, if you read through Scripture, you see the name Herod pop up from time to time, but the reality is there's more than one Herod that is described in Scripture. So I want to give us a little history lesson so we can separate out the different ones. The first one of some significance is known as Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was actually sympathetic to the Jews. He did one very significant thing, and that was what? To support the Jews. He's the one who rebuilt the temple. That the temple of uh, Solomon had been destroyed as a consequence of the Babylonian exile. And so the temple was rebuilt by Herod during this time period so that the temple was in full existence when Jesus was born. Okay, So he had been supportive of the people of Israel. Now... Then, though, when Jesus was born, Herod the Great did what with regard to Jesus? Well, he first said that he wanted to worship him. He told the Magi, go and find out where he is, come back and tell me, and then he'll go and worship them, which was a lie. He was threatened by Jesus because he heard this prophecy that he was the Messiah and there's something special about him. And Herod the Great was a person who liked power, and certainly he was rooted in pride. And he wanted to find out who this Jesus was and put him to death. And The Lord gave a vision to Mary and Joseph, and they actually went to Egypt to take Jesus and protect him. And um, when Herod the Great found out that he'd been misled, that he actually did what? That was so terrible. He had all of the young males under the age of two in the area of Bethlehem put to death. Now think about what a dark man this really is. That on the one hand, he supports the Jews having the temple rebuilt. He likes that because it makes him look good. It gives him a position of power and pride. But then on the other, he is willing to murder little baby boys because he feels threatened by a baby. Now again, you've got to understand that in this man, there is great darkness. Now when it says he's a king, what he really is is like the Roman governor of that region. There were different governors in different places. And if you'll think back about Scripture, Herod and Pilate had a little bit of debate going on between each other at the time of Jesus being arrested because one had sovereignty over one area and the other had sovereignty over another area. But the fact is that this King Herod is really, he's a, he's a Roman governor. He's the king of a province, and he's a very wicked man. Now, he had a, several sons. Among those was a son by the name of Aristobulus, and Aristobulus became a threat to his own father. And later in life, when 
this King Herod was near the latter days of his life, he actually had his own son put to death, Aristobulus. Now, this King Herod that we're talking about in this scripture is the grandson of Herod the Great. He's the son of Aristobulus. When he was four or five years old was when his father was murdered by his grandfather. Now, do you get an idea of how much darkness there is in this family? And it's worse. When Herod the Great died, the next Herod, the next Roman governor in that region, was Herod Antipas. And Antipas was in control at the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. That is, Jesus as an adult. And what did Herod Antipas do with regard to John the Baptist? He had him beheaded. Now, you see, you get a picture of this family tree where there is a great problem with murder, really. A stronghold of murder. Now, we were talking about pride last week being fertile ground for prejudice. Pride is fertile ground for any place where evil can enter our hearts and begin to work through us. Any place where pride is strong in our hearts is an avenue where a spirit of evil can gain entrance into our heart and work through us. Now, in the case of these Herods, there is clearly what I would refer to as a demonic spirit of death or a demonic spirit of murder working through them. It didn't gain that stronghold without their permission. Basically, by their pride and their own sin, they have allowed it in. But it is working feverishly to persecute the church, and probably it was Satan himself working through these people to try to get right at the heart of the church. And so now, one of the things that I want to do before I go on discussing this scripture is talk about this problem of generational strongholds. Because clearly in this family, there is a very, very dark generational stronghold. And generational strongholds start where a person opens themselves up by their own sin and allows some spirit to get a root in them. And then it is cast on to the next generations. The, the scripture says the sins of the fathers will go to the third and the fourth generation. Now, even though the scripture says that, you've got to take the whole of scripture whenever you're looking at one. And the reason I say that is just where the scripture says that the sins of the fathers will be passed to the third and the fourth generation, does that mean that you must wait three or four generations for it to be broken? And I would say no, given the whole of Scripture, any person in the lineage of a family who rises up to know Christ can be the person who breaks a generational stronghold. In fact, if you look at the kings of Israel, you know, some of them would follow the Lord and some would not, and some would be very wicked and they would worship other gods, and then would arise a new king who followed the Lord and, and led the whole people of Israel toward following the Lord. And so now, for many people in this room, and there were several people gathered around to pray, and they were dealing with some things that seemed like pretty serious spiritual warfare, and we were praying about different things and different people, and there was this man in the room, and as I came to him, I really felt like the Lord said to me, he's clean, like there's nothing to pray for. And we've been praying all these serious issues in this family, and I came to this one man, it's like, and I said, I think the Lord is saying that he's clean. And I didn't know all the people at the time, and, but this, the people with him said, oh, he comes from a long line of people who know the Lord and his family, and, and he had married into this. And literally, his family heritage was much different from others there. But now for many of us, there have been places where spirits of evil have gained some foothold in our family history. And those could be things like lying, strongholds of lying, or gossip, or stealing, or greed, or covetousness. Any of those kinds of things that are outside the will of God, they can be strongholds in a family tree. It can be adultery. It could be... Even murder. I've seen family trees where there was a pattern of murder in the family tree. 
even where one parent murdered the other and a child was telling me about it, things of that nature. Now, if you have issues in your family tree that are affecting you and you've seen the reality of those, you must do several things. One, you must confront them, acknowledge the reality that it exists. Then you must try to identify what is the root of it. Where did it start? What family member? What was it that they did? Or how did it come in? Was it pride? Is there pride in you that's allowing it to continue? What is it? Then to break it, you must forgive those who have come before you. You must acknowledge their sin and forgive them. And sometimes it's a, you need to forgive in a way that you didn't realize. For example, you know, in some family trees, there is a history of the men never being spiritual leaders. Always abdicating their responsibility as spiritual leaders to their wives. And you see, that's a stronghold of sin that's a pattern down through generations. And if that was the case, let's say with your dad, you need to forgive your dad for not being a spiritual leader. For those of you who had a dad who was a spiritual leader, you need to give thanks. If he's still alive, you might want to even say that to him specifically. Thank you for being a good spiritual leader. But you see, this is very important that if this was the case where you did not have that, that you would acknowledge that failure and you would forgive because by forgiving the prior generation, you break the opportunity for that generational stronghold to continue. And likewise, you need to invite the Holy Spirit in you to teach you how to overcome it. Maybe you didn't have parents who modeled what it was like to be Christian parents or a dad who was a spiritual leader, but now you're, say, married and you got little kids of your own. The Lord can teach you himself how to be the spiritual leader in your household. But you should forgive what has occurred before and invite his spirit to work through you in order that this generational stronghold would be broken and not carried on. And I think there's so much there that affects us far more than we realize that all of us need to examine how could this still be playing an effect in our lives as we're walking with Christ and invite him to show you so that you would be set free. Now let's go back here to this situation. We know that there's this terribly dark stronghold in the household of Herod and that he has put James to death. Now we need to talk about James. James was one of the original 12 disciples. Both John and James, brothers, were a part of the 12. And now we've already seen the first martyr that's recorded, and that was Stephen. But Stephen was sort of short-lived on the scene. That is, as far as we know, we know he was a man of faith, and God used him significantly in, a, in this brief period of time. But, but he was stoned to death as the first martyr. And then here now, James becomes the second martyr. He's the first of the disciples to die other than Jesus who committed suicide. But he's the first one to die as a martyr. And there is this question that arises as to why would Jesus invest in the life of James and all of these disciples, the eleven, for several years, fill them with the Holy Spirit, launch them out in the early church, and then allow James to die a martyr in the earliest days. To me, that's a really important question to raise. Of Here is one of the special people, and yet God allows him to die very early as a martyr. And what is interesting about it to me is that James and John and Peter seem to be the most select or the most special of the disciples. You will find that if you'll go back and look at things like the transfiguration, it was James and John and Peter who were with Jesus at the transfiguration. When Jairus' daughter was healed, James and John and Peter. In the Garden of Gethsemane, same thing. There was something about these three that was special. And the Lord had given James and John even a special title. What did he call them? The Sons of Thunder, which would make me believe that they weren't quiet and timid guys, 
but probably pretty bold and brash like Peter. Maybe the three of them, you know, they were the, maybe the most bold and brash of the disciples. And it would seem that these three were special, yet here is this one who dies very early. And, and why would God allow it? See, even James and John, they're the ones who said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can we sit at your right and your left? In other words, they wanted to be the vice presidents. And Jesus said, can you drink of the cup that I drink, or can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they said, sure, we can. And he said, in fact, you will be, which might have been a prophecy about what was going to occur with regard to James. But you see now, I think it's important to recognize that here is one of the special disciples and early his life ends. Now we'll come back to that issue of why. Let us continue in this scripture. It says that when he saw this pleased the Jews, that is when Herod saw that the death of James pleased the Jews. What Jews is he talking about here? Well, the high priest and the others who were persecuting the church, they're probably the ones who had aroused Herod to persecute the church, although I'm sure it was Satan working through Herod who was actually doing it. And so in this case, it says, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to have Peter seized. Now, see, here's a recognition of the wickedness of this man that in his desire for power that he's now pleased by the fact that others are looking at him as someone who's persecuting the church. And he says, well, I'll do it more. That I'll gain greater favor with the, the Jewish people by persecuting them more. And so what he does here is he has Peter arrested, says around the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he puts him in prison. He has a number of guards who stay with him throughout the day so that he couldn't possibly get away. And it says he's going to wait till the Passover is over. In other words, until this feast is over. And then he's going to put him on public trial. He didn't want to do anything during the Jewish feast that might upset somebody. And so he's going to put Peter on trial. And more than likely, what is he going to do? He's going to put him to death. Now, if you go back to that scripture where it says that he put James to death, it says he put him to death by the sword, which means more than likely he did what? He had him beheaded. And you see now, remember in that family tree, like John the Baptist was beheaded and so forth, there's this wickedness. And of course, we see the same kind of wickedness, that same spirit of murder in the world today. But in this case, it says that he's preparing to put Peter on trial, and more than likely, Peter's going to die as a consequence. But then the very next verses say that Peter was kept in prison, and the church was earnestly praying for him. Now, when it says the church, it's talking about those who are believers, right? Now, the Scripture does not say that they were praying for James. But I would find it very hard to believe that they were not praying for James. In fact, I would say the same people who were praying for Peter here were the ones who were praying for James. And it says that the night before Herod was to bring Peter to trial that he was asleep, two soldiers were guarding him there, there were even sentries around him, there were always four soldiers with him. And it says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in his cell. The angel slapped Peter, basically, and woke him up, said, get up, we're out of here. It says the chains fell off of his wrist, that uh, he, Peter, now he's, he thinks he's seeing a vision, but he's following the angel out, and and he, he's not quite sure because he's been asleep. He's waking up like, is this real or is this not real? You've had a dream like that, haven't you, where you, where you woke up and you thought, is this real or not? Mo most of the time for me, it's like I'm glad it's not because it was a dream that was, whoa. But in this case, he wakes up, he realizes, and it says they go right past the guards, like the guards didn't even see them, that the door opened itself, that the angel led him out into the street, and then the angel was gone. Now, I absolutely believe, as we talked about last week, that angels are real, that they are at work in our lives, and that this could occur then, and it can occur now. In fact, um, 
I heard a testimony quite a number of years ago. It was after 9-11, and the U.S. had gone into Afghanistan, and there was a Christian young lady who was a missionary there who was captured by the Taliban, and, and there was this concern that she was going to be raped and murdered and all these kinds of things. And, and uh, in one of the battles when the Taliban uh, retreated, they actually found this girl in a warehouse, just left there. She had not been harmed. She hadn't been violated in any way. And she said that her captors would, would always treat her in a way that just, in, in some ways, it didn't make sense. I heard her give her testimony after this. And that it appeared that God had supernaturally protected her, probably with angels, so that she was not harmed. Even in the battle that was taking place right around her, she could have been hit by fire. She wasn't harmed. And then when the soldiers came to this area, they just found her there. And, you know, if you'll, like Billy Graham wrote a book entitled Angel some years ago, and, and he told a lot of stories in there about people where they believed they had encountered angels in some form or another. Uh, a friend of ours, they lived up in Ohio, and they were driving through New York, um, oh, about four years ago. And um, I think they were in bad weather or something. Whatever happened, the car, she, the lady driving lost control of the car. It was at night. Her husband was asleep. They went off the road and down an embankment, and the car flipped over and so forth. And um, her husband was asleep, which probably helped him. And, but he, of course, was awakened by all of this, and he was uh, conscious when the car came to a halt, but she was knocked unconscious. And he told me the story. He said, almost immediately, there was a man who appeared there, right at the door. And he said, I couldn't understand it because we'd gone down a long embankment, and I couldn't imagine how somebody could get down there so quickly and so forth. He said that man was there with them and, and taking care of them. And it's, I can't remember all the details, but her arm was seriously injured. And he had to do something for her that she ended up being able to keep her arm, but she had to have a number of surgeries. But it was something about if they hadn't addressed it immediately, she would have lost her arm. I don't remember exactly what happened. But in any event, he told the story and he said, then when the actual rescue people arrived, this man who had been there was gone. And he asked about him, and people didn't know, didn't see anybody. And he was convinced that an angel must have been with them during the wreck and was standing right there as soon as it was over. And he saw him, and then he was gone. In fact, last night I told this, about this in the, the service, and a lady sent me a, a message afterwards and said that one of her family members had a wreck similar violent wreck, the car was totally destroyed, the police thought nobody could have lived through this, that they walked out of it unharmed, except for they got poison ivy going through the place where they had to walk to get out. And she said they were convinced an angel of the Lord had protected them. And I, probably most of us would say there were times in our lives when we thought an angel may have protected us. We may not have seen them, but something went on. And so I, I certainly believe this could occur with no problem. It's God's sovereign uh, intervention here that he has delivered Peter from captivity. And so then Peter, he, uh, he realizes that God has set him free from the clutches of Herod. And he decides he better go find some of the other people who are believers. So he goes to the house of Mary. Now, again, there are names here in these scriptures that can confuse us because this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is the Mary, the mother of John, who is also called Mark. He's better known as Mark. He's the one who wrote the book of Mark. Now, this is not the same John who was there, the brother of James that we just mentioned in the scripture a few minutes ago. And it says that people were gathered at her house, and these were the people praying for Peter. Peter goes there and knocks on the door, and this servant girl, Rhoda, answers the door. And that when she recognizes Peter's voice, she does the natural thing. She's excited, and she runs back and tells everybody, but she doesn't open the door. And we give Rhoda a little bit of a hard time because she's like, you know, you at least could have let him in. But in reality, she's a servant girl. Maybe when she hears that it's Peter, she doesn't feel like she's worthy of opening the door for him. Or maybe she's afraid that Peter is out there with Roman guards and she's afraid to open the door. So I don't think we should give Rhoda too much of a hard time. But it is a bit funny that she leaves him at the door and runs back into the house and, and explains to these people who've been praying for him that Peter is out here and they're what? They say, you are out of your mind. 
Now, now get this. These are the people who are praying for Peter to be set free. And she says they're here, and they say, impossible. But you're praying for this impossible thing, are you not? And she insists about this, and they keep saying, well, it must be an angel or something. It couldn't be Peter. Now, is it not true that probably in all of our lives there have been times when you pray diligently for something for a long period of time, it came to pass, and when it did, you said, I can't believe it. Isn't that right? And really it's like, why can't you? It's like, this is what you were asking the Lord to do, and it was his will, and he intervened. So here it is that Peter is at the door, now he remembers Jesus saying, knock and the door shall be opened unto you, which is actually a scripture that applies to something else, but it fits in this case, right? But he, Peter says uh, he kept on knocking, and finally they were astonished when they saw him at the door, and he goes in, and, and here again, now it says, Peter says, tell James and the brothers about this. Again, this could be confusing because what? You thought James had been put to death. Is it possible that Peter didn't know about that? No, I'm sure Peter knew. In fact, this is a different James. This is James who is the half-brother of Jesus. He was not one of the 12 disciples, but in the early church, James, the half-brother of Jesus, becomes one of the primary leaders of the church in this region. And so he's telling this to James because James is one that people look to as a leader in this community. And then he moves on. Now, the question I would raise at this point is similar but opposite of the question I raised earlier. In other words, why would God allow James to die? And now, why would God supernaturally intervene and set Peter free from the exact same circumstance in such a way that it was clear that it was the hand of God and no other. Why would he do this? Or you might ask the question, why did he not do this for James? Now, is it not true in our lives that we encounter circumstances like this? That there are times when you would say, Lord, why did you not intervene? And there are other times when you're praying for his intervention and you see it so clearly and so supernaturally. In my personal life, the clearest example of that is something I've referred to many times in different ways, but maybe not in this part of it. I mentioned often that my son, second son was born and had surgery the day he was born. It took about six months b between the time that he got out of the hospital and he finally got through most of this and we were just about to the place of saying, I believe we're going to be okay. And then almost exactly six months after that he was born, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And his early prognosis was good. But almost to the day of my son's birth was the day that my father died. There was two days difference between them. And I thought the way it looked that my father was going to die right on my son's birthday. In fact, I remember we, there, were two, there was a two-day difference. And we, I remember we tried to have a little birthday party for my son for his first birthday. And we left to go to the hospital. And even in trying to have the birthday party, we had a cake with one little candle on it. And he reached up and grabbed the flame. So that didn't go so well. Just fit in with all the other crying that was going on at the time. But in my own life, we, would, we believe that God healed my son at a point that he was supposed to have another major surgery, and they came in and canceled the surgery, never had it. We believe God healed him. The exact same people were praying. Many of the circumstances were similar, even though it was a different issue. And almost a year to the day later, my father died. And inevitably, in my heart, there was a why. As I've mentioned to you before, my father, I was... 
he was disabled when I was young, so I sort of became his father. When he died, it was like my son dying, my friend dying, and my father dying all at the same time. And I had dreaded that day. Just, it scared me. And so I had prayed probably more earnestly even that the Lord would spare him. And yet, one was yes and one was no, at least from my perspective. And you see, what we're talking about here really in this situation is about Peter and James. And there is this reality that God is the one who is sovereign over all things. And you and I need to learn to accept that and trust in His sovereignty. Because there are times when things come to pass in our lives that we would not want. Many of you could tell about situations where it wasn't a consequence of your choice. It wasn't a consequence of your sin. Just a situation arose that you did not want. And you begged and pleaded that it would be different. And yet God said, no, this is the direction you will continue. And you and I need to learn to submit to and accept God's sovereignty, that He is in charge of all things. Like we've been talking here for several weeks about inviting the Holy Spirit to pour out in our lives in a greater way, in this church in a greater way. This has been a desire of the elders for a long time. We've talked about this many times. That the desire of the hearts of the people who are elders in this church is to see an outpouring of the Spirit among us. But you see, if the desire of the hearts of the elders was to plant churches in 50 states, you know what we could do? We could get on it and go do it. But when the desire is to see the Spirit of the Lord poured out, He's the only one who can do that. All we can do is try to get rid of the barriers and be in a position to be used by Him. But now in all of our lives, there are things that probably you would say... That's not what I would have chosen, but it's God's sovereign will. We'll go a little further here. In this case, you know, after Peter is freed, Herod is upset, and Herod being Herod, what does he do? He has the guards who were keeping, uh, keeping Peter executed. That would have been 16 of them. It wasn't just one. And then... Shortly thereafter, it's, the Scripture says in the very next verse that Herod went to Caesarea, that there'd been some problems there. He'd been quarreling with the people in Tyre and Sidon, and that he wanted an audience with them. And so um, it says that he put on his royal robes, and he addressed the crowd to deal with this issue, and he delivered a public address that all the people, and the people responded that, well, this is the voice of a God. He's not even a man. This man is so powerful and majestic and so forth. And yet the Scripture says immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him dead. Now, this is a cumulative effect of what's going on in his life. Because you can see the pattern of his life is such that finally God has said enough. And you know, the scripture does say that there is a sin unto death. Now, I think the context of that scripture is primarily addressing believers. That you can be one who believes in God and knows him, and you can choose to go down some sinful path. And if you continue on that path as an act of love, God will say, I'm going to take you out of this world before you completely destroy your life. There is a sin unto death. I believe likewise there is a similar thing for unbelievers. That you can continue down a path that is so ruthless and so wretched that eventually God says, enough, I will not tolerate it anymore. Which is what he did with Herod in this case. Now I haven't done this very often but on a few occasions, I've been talking with someone who's been down a path that is a rebellious path toward the Lord, and they are not truly repentant. 
And I have literally warned people, do you realize there is a sin unto death? You see, in the modern church, we want to emphasize the soft side of God, that he truly is love. But there is this reality that he created all things, that he is sovereign, that every one of us must have given an account for our lives, that he will judge us in this life and certainly at the end, that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But he brings judgment upon us in this world as an act of love. And there is a place where you can continue in a path that he says, my judgment is your life must end. And that is the case with Herod. Now, in all three of these circumstances, James, Peter, and Herod, what is clear? The one who is sovereignly in charge of human life is God himself. Now, this is not a perfect analogy, but it's reasonable, and some of you have encountered it and used it before. But when you think of God's will, I think of it like, a, like an interstate. And um, God has a perfect will for us. Now, is it, it's God, is it God's will that you sin? No. But when you sin, then what happens? You are choosing in your will to violate his, but he is allowing it. He permits it. People refer to his permissive will. It's not what he would desire. It's not his optimum will. But it is what he permits within the confines of this world. And if you're going down the interstate of life and you're in his will, there are a lot of exit ramps. Temptations and things that will take you away from what is his primary will. Sometimes you get off an exit ramp, you immediately realize that was foolish, and you get back on the next uh, entrance ramp. That is, you, you make a mistake, you repent, and you quickly turn. But sometimes you get off his will, and you head into the, the back country, and the roads are unexplored, and you think, wow, this is nice, maybe I should have come over here before, I, there's a lot of pretty sights. But what you don't realize is that darkness is going to come and you're going to end up lost and over in the black lagoon somewhere. And usually people get far enough into the quagmire that it's a real gory mess and then they're like, God help me. And he will. If you're truly repentant, he'll show you the path back, show you the road, how to get back on one of those entrance ramps. But there is this reality that if, if you miss 20 miles of his perfect will, you will miss some of his blessings. There are some people who miss his perfect will almost all of their lives, who don't come to know him until late in their lives, and they realize they have squandered their entire lives. It's real. And what they have forfeited are not only the blessings in this life, but also some eternal rewards. You know, people say you shouldn't preach eternal security because it gives people a license to sin. If that's the case, people don't understand sin. It doesn't give you a license to do anything. It gives you a license to love is what it does, that you're secure in him and he's the one who loves you and gives you the capacity to love others. But any time that you step outside of his will, there will be consequences. It's always the case. And he will allow you to suffer the consequences of that in order to teach you and make you something better. But getting, on an ex, uh, getting off at an exit ramp will have a cost. But now God in his love will bring you back on. He'll get you back in his will because if you seek him, he's given you a measure of freedom, but your, your freedom is limited to the parameters that he has established. And if you seek him within those, he'll put you back in his perfect will. In fact, it amazes me how he will do that. That when he says your, your sins are forgiven, it is like they are truly, factually, completely forgiven. He does not look at you and say you're unqualified because of your mistakes. He looks at you and says, you're qualified because my son lives in you. And his shed blood has made you perfect. And he wants to use you to his glory. His perfect will is using you to his glory. Now, sometimes I think his will is like driving around Atlanta where there are like 16 lanes. You can change lanes. You can speed up. You can slow down. You can listen to the radio. You can keep your windows down, whatever you want to do. Within the parameters of his perfect will, he gives you latitude. You can make some decisions. 
You know, like if you're trying to decide where to go on vacation, he might, he might say, look, you can go three or four or five different places. And they all might be within his perfect will. Sometimes he might say there's only one because I got a job for you while you're on vacation. I've had that happen many times. It always makes me feel good about going on vacation and I end up having an opportunity to minister to somebody while there. I'm like, it was worth it. And then sometimes, though, I think that his perfect will becomes narrow. It's like a two-lane road. Sometimes it's a one-lane road. I think for all of us, we come to a place where his will is this way and it's only one. And if you miss it at that point, it might be the critical juncture of your life. I mean, look at the lives of people around you. There are people who are making choices, who are missing at the critical moments God's perfect will. And what it does is establish that there is a limitation on how far God can use them. Not because of his lack of ability, but because of their lack of willingness. And you see, what I see in this scripture here in Acts is that God is absolutely sovereign. And I want to stay within his will. I mean, if I am inching out of it, I want him to direct me back. I guess that's so strong in my heart because I know how, how costly it is to walk outside of it. You know, as I mentioned, as a young person, I missed it. And I know how costly that is. And I know how rich are the blessings of the Lord for those who have a broken and contrite heart and seek him day by day. Now, it doesn't guarantee that you'll always be riding on the blessings. Because within his sovereignty, sometimes the blessings come through challenges. Sometimes he will allow what you ask him not to allow. And this is the reality of he is the one who knows. I think all, all of his sovereign will is pure love. But from this side of eternity, we can't see that some of the time. I will add this, though. I loved my dad in a way that was unusual. As I said, because he was like, sort of like a son to me. And I did realize that I needed to release him in order to grow in my relationship with God himself. In other words, that I love my dad inordinately. And I had to let him go in order to grow in my relationship with God. And so now, many years have passed, I can actually look back and realize that God taking him was a pure act of love. In fact, I, I've seen fruit come in several places of my family as a consequence of that. It certainly wasn't what I desired. I was begging differently. But he is the one who sovereignly knows. And what you and I must trust is that his sovereign will is his best. It is his love for you, for me, in every circumstance. Even though some of those are extraordinarily tough. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for any person here who may have developed bitterness toward you. That by your sovereign choices, things occurred in ways that they did not want. And they've become bitter toward you. I pray, Lord, that they would receive forgiveness ask for forgiveness and receive it. That you would let them know how deep and rich and wide is your love for every one of us. 
And even in the circumstances that we cannot understand, your love is true. Lord, I just pray that your spirit would truly bring healing, understanding, and wholeness in this area. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.